Now we will have uh, Simon Padrix, who is uh, a group leader at uh, INRIA, and uh, he, he will talk about uh, a complete equation theory, equational theory for uh, quantum circuits. So great pleasure to have you here, Simon, and uh, indeed the stage now is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction. So today I want to talk about quantum circuits and in particular about completeness. So I'm going to explain what it means in a few slides. So this is a joint work with uh, Alexandre Clément, who is uh, here, uh, Nicolas Hurtel, Shane Mansfield, and Benoit Vallion. So we are going to talk about uh, quantum circuits. Oops. So I think I don't really need to introduce quantum circuits. We are all using quantum circuits. This model has been introduced in the 80s by uh, David Deutsch. And uh, here we have an example of such a quantum circuit with, uh, with a control knot here, Hadamard. Here, phase gates, which are actually Z rotations, and a swap here. Okay, so we are all using quantum circuits. This model is really ubiquitous in quantum computing. And uh, in general, once you, you have a quantum circuit, you often want to transform it, okay, to transform it in order to uh, do a resource optimization. So we have seen in, uh, in the previous talks uh, various examples of uh, circuit transformations. Uh, so for resource optimization, for uh, satisfying hardware constraints, or to make the, the circuit fault tolerant, or just to show that two circuits are equivalent, you can transform one into the other. Okay, um, Okay. so for this transformation, it's useful to, to have a, an equational theory or a set of rules which are telling you what you can do with your circuits. Okay, so for instance, here I put some standard uh, equations. So for instance, when you have two C naught, you can just remove these two C naught. If you have three C naught, you can put a swap and so on. Okay, some equation, basic equations that allows you to transform your circuit. And uh, so it's a way to transform your circuit or maybe to prove that your transformation is correct. And more generally, it's a way to reason on quantum circuits. Okay? And uh, the, the key property when you have uh, such an equational theory, a set of rules, is to, uh, is to prove the completeness of the equations, which means that any true equations about quantum circuits can be derived using your equational theory, okay, your basic uh, set of rules. So this is really a key property for uh, equational theory and reasoning about quantum circuits. So when we talk about uh, completeness, it's important to distinguish circuit and matrices. So for me, a circuit is really a graph, a graphical representation where you have uh, generators, so C0, Hadamard, uh, Z rotation, phase gates, and you connect them using wires. But this is really a graphical object. And if I want to talk about the matrix, which is implemented by this circuit, I'm going to use this, uh, this funny bracket notation, which associates with any circuit uh, the matrix which is implemented by this circuit. So in this case, the, the control Z uh, matrix, OK? Um, OK, so, and with this notation, we can formally define the notion of completeness. Um, so an equational theory, a set of equations, is complete if for any pair of circuits implementing the same unitary, you can actually transform the circuit C1 into C2 using your equational theory. This is uh, what this notation means. You can transform C1 into C2 using the equations, the rules you have. OK, so this is the notion of completeness. Let me give you a toy example. So here we have three uh, basic equations. And uh, let's call it uh, E0, this equational theory. So you can uh, transform your circuits using these equations, but uh, obviously this uh, uh, set of equations is not complete. And here is an example. If I take these two uh, uh, circuits, they are both implementing control Z. Okay, so here for this one, we have seen it here. Maybe this one you already know. If you take C0, put Hadamard, it's a control Z. So they are implementing the same unitary transformation, but we cannot transform this one into this one using these equations. Uh, one way to see it is, for instance, to see that uh, in the equational theory, the number of Hadamards is preserved, is an invariant. Okay? And here we have to transform this circuit with two Hadamards into this one which has no Hadamard. So it's not possible. Okay? So here we have an example of an equational theory which is not complete. Okay, so what is the state of the art uh, in terms of uh, quantum circuit completeness? Um, uh, so. We have a few uh, partial results. So um, in particular, uh, this one is interesting by Bian and Selinger. 
uh, which is about Clifford plus T circuits, but just for two qubit circuits. So it's a, a set of equations. So here there are actually 20 equations. Here just give you a the flavor of this equational theory by showing three equations. And they prove that if you take two circuits acting on two qubits, then you can transform one into the other using these equations. So it's complete for two qubit circuits. But if your circuit has more than two qubits, we don't have the completeness with this result. Um, at QPL this year, so which means uh, last week, the same authors presented uh, an extension of this, uh, which is working for th quantum circuits on three qubits, with a slightly different uh, set of generators, Clifford plus uh, control S. Okay, so there are other uh, results for fragments of uh, quantum circuits, like the Clifford one, Toffoli, and some other uh, fragments. All these fragments are not universal. They can be efficiently simulated on a classical computer. And uh, so the main result that I want to show you today is a complete equational theory for arbitrary quantum circuits, okay? So for a universal uh, model of quantum circuits. Okay, so um, in order to prove that, uh, all you need is love. What I mean is that all you need is the love calculus uh, which is a graphical language for optical quantum computing. So it's, uh, it might be surprising that for proving something on usual quantum circuits, we are going to use optical, uh, optical circuits. So here is uh, the overview of the rest of the talk. So I will focus on this uh, law of calculus, so this language for optical quantum uh, computing so in the next few, few slides. And then I will go back to the quantum circuits. Okay, so the law of calculus, the idea of the law of calculus is to have a formal framework for these kind of things, okay? This kind of uh, optical uh, settings. And uh, so this is a project that uh, we have developed with, uh, in particular with uh, Quandela, which is a startup working on this photonic quantum computer. And the idea is really to have a formal framework to deal with uh, op photonic quantum computing. So here we have an example of circuits made of various generators that you can use in uh, optical quantum computing, wave plates, phase shifters, beam splitters, polarizing beam splitters, and so on. For this talk, I will, we will focus just on a fragment of this, and we will consider only beam splitters and phase shifters, okay? If you are interested in uh, the other generators, please have a look to the paper. You will see that the, all the results that I'm going to talk about can be generalized to the other generators. Okay, so what are these two generators? So the beam splitter. So the idea is that if you have a photon here, you will get the photon here with some amplitude, which is a cos theta, so the, the parameter here. And the photon will be here with this amplitude, I sine theta, okay? Uh, it's perfectly uh, symmetric, so if you put it upside down, you have the same uh, behavior. And for the phase shifter, if a photon goes through the phase shifter, you get a global phase, e to the i phi. Okay, so you can uh, take these uh, generators, compose them, and get an optical circuit like this one. Um, so when we have an optical circuit, we, we can associate a matrix describing the behavior of this optical circuit which is a n by n matrix, where n is the number of inputs and outputs, okay? So it's not exponential in the number of wires, it's really linear. And the idea of this matrix, it's, uh, it describes the behavior, how a photon behaves. So for instance, in this entry, so second column, third row, it's the amplitude for a photon to go from this input, the second input, to the third output. So this matrix is describing the behavior of your optical circuit, and you can construct it inductively. So for instance, here is the rule for the parallel composition. If you have two circuits, you put them in parallel, the matrix is the direct sum of the two matrices. Okay? Notice that this is not the tensor product, contrary to quantum circuits. Here it's the direct sum. This is the, one of the main fundamental difference between quantum circuits and optical circuits. Okay, so for any circuit, the matrix you are uh, constructing like this is a unitary matrix. Again, the dimension is n, the number of uh, inputs and outputs of your circuits. Okay, so it's a unitary transformation by construction, and it turns out that this model is actually universal. This is a well-known result by Rekhet al. in the 90s, 
for any unitary transformation, you can build a, a, an optical circuit with this uh, triangular shape, which is implementing this unitary transformation. Okay. Okay, so what we proved is uh, our contribution is to introduce this set of equations, of seven equations on uh, optical circuits, and prove that these seven equations form a complete proof, a complete equational theory for optical circuits. So I don't have enough time to actually go uh, through these, uh, all these equations, and maybe you cannot really see it because the screen is small. Uh, instead, I just want to show you how we prove that such an equation, an, an equational theory, is complete. Right? How can we do such proof, such a proof? Okay, so the idea is that first we message a little bit this equational theory in order to get this one, which is equivalent to the previous one. It's a little bit more equations, but it's equivalent to the previous one. And once we have this equational theory, what is interesting is that we can give actually an orientation to the rules. We can say that, uh, okay, once we have the, the left-hand side part of the, the equation, we replace it by the right-hand side. Okay, we get a rewriting system. And this rewriting system has all the good properties that we can expect. Uh, it's terminating, so which means that if you start from a circuit, you cannot apply uh, these kind of rules forever. And it's also confluent. So it means that if you can apply several rules, even if they are uh, somehow overlapping, uh, you can apply one or the other. You can always close the diamond and uh, so get a common circuit at the end of the day. And these two properties guarantees that uh, if you start with any uh, quantum circuit, or uh, optical circuit, you apply these rules, you will end up with what we call a normal form, a circuit in normal form. And this normal form is nothing but the triangular shape, the rec et al. Uh, property, okay, of the racket al property. Okay, so you start with any circuit, optical circuit, you apply the rules, you end up with this, this circuit. Uh, you can add some extra conditions on the angles in order to guarantee that this circuit is unique. And actually, this is all we need to, to prove the completeness of the rewriting rules. Because now, if I take two circuits uh, having the same, uh, representing the same unitary transformation, I can use these rewriting rules to put both of them in normal form, in this form. By unicity of the normal form, uh, it's actually the same. And so we have now the path from C1 to C2 to prove that they are equivalent. Okay? So this is how we prove completeness for uh, this set of equations. Notice that this rewriting system has been uh, implemented. So you can use uh, in Perceval, which is the software developed by Candela. So if you, if you want to play with this uh, kind of rewriting rules, uh, it's uh, open source, so you can, uh, you can use it. Okay, so now let me go back to uh, our initial question, which is uh, completeness for quantum circuits. Um, okay, so, so far I have uh, no equations about uh, quantum circuits, okay, but I have these optical circuits for which I know a, a complete equational theory. And I'm going to use this, using this, uh, this idea here, which is a kind of completion procedure. So I take two circuits, CA, CB, so two quantum circuits, and the idea is to translate, to encode these two circuits into optical circuits with the same semantics, okay? I'm looking for an encoding which is preserving the semantics, the unitary transformations which is represented by these circuits. And now, by completeness of the optical circuits, I know that I can, I can transform CA into CB, okay? The encoded CA into the encoded CB, by completeness. And now the idea is to lift this proof from the optical circuits to the quantum circuits. And to do this, we can use a decoding map, mapping optical circuits into quantum circuits, in such a way that now we have the, the skeleton of the proofs. We have the intermediate steps and we just need to fill the gaps, okay, to finish the proof, okay, and have, and now the idea with this completion procedure is to find enough equations to guarantee that we can fill the gaps here, but uh, each of these gaps is somehow finite, so it's, it's, uh, it's doable. Okay, so this is the idea of the proof. Um, actually, there are some technicalities, and uh, to be frank, at first I was uh, skeptical that, uh, that it would work, um, in particular because the parallel composition in the two models are very different. Okay? On one side we have the tensor product, on the other side we have the direct sum, 
and there are some technicalities because of this. Okay, so let me give you some uh, insights about, uh, about this proof. So first about the encoding, decoding, and also how we, how we fill the, the gaps here. So regarding the encoding, so the, the, the idea is to uh, encode quantum circuit into an optical circuit. So for instance, for the phase gate here, the Z rotation, so it's uh, representing a two by two matrix. So I'm going to encode it using two uh, uh, wires in optical circuits. One wire corresponds to the K0 state and the other one for the K1 state. So uh, I'm just doing nothing on K0 and apply the phase on K1. Okay, it's standard encoding of a phase gate into optical uh, circuits. For the C0, I have a, a four by four matrix. So four wires for uh, the optical circuit and C0 is exchanging these two basis states. I can continue with this example. So here, identity tends for uh, the phase gate. Uh, well, we apply the phase on the state K01 and K11. So this is this optical circuit. Um, what is interesting here is that actually the circuit, the optical circuit we get here, encoding this piece of circuit, is actually not the parallel composition of the encoding of the identity and the encoding of the phase gate. Okay, here I'm encoding uh, this parallel composition, but I'm not getting the parallel composition of the encoding. The reason is that the encoding of the identity is just the identity, so here it should be just a wire if it is the parallel composition of the two. Okay, so this is the, the, this problem that the parallel composition is not the same in both models. And the solution here is to sequentialize our circuit. That is really to translate it, uh, to sequentialize it and translate it slice by slice. The slice being just identities everywhere except one gate. Okay. And this is what we need to do uh, to, to define actually the, 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 the translation. So let's see an example. So if I start with C0 in parallel with Hadamard, so I choose this uh, sequentialization and I get this circuit corresponding to uh, the encoding of uh, the initial circuit. If I uh, use the, the, the sequentialization the other way around, I will get uh, a slightly different uh, circuit. And it's not obvious that they are equivalent, but they are. OK, so this is for the encoding, for the decoding. So for the same reason, we need sequentialization. So for instance, here I'm decoding a phase shifter. So the phase shifter, if I have the identity here, it's just a phase gate. But uh, now, uh, if my slice is made of four wires, uh, then uh, here the phase shifter is applied on ket11. So it corresponds to a control phase. Okay. More generally, if I have eight wires, uh, this can corresponds to a control control phase, and so on. Okay. So now you see. Uh, you see how it works. If the phase shifter is not on the last qubit, on the last wire, I can also translate it with a control control phase with a negated control here. Okay, but we really need to con consider the context. That is, it's really uh, the all the, the slides that we are translating. And uh, so here we are using controlled operation, multi-controlled operations, which is not part of the generators of the language. But the good news is that we can actually define these multi-controlled gates uh, inductively. Okay? This is a standard uh, Baron Co et al. Uh, paper, probably. Um, so we can define a multi-controlled gate using three instances of multi-controlled gate acting on n minus one qubits. You also divide the angle by two. So it's not obvious, but you can do it. OK, so with our example, so it, uh, it goes as follows. So we start uh, with our circuit. If we encode it as an optical circuit, we get this. And now if we decode this optical circuit, we get this quantum circuit. Okay, with each gate here, it's translated as a, a multi-controlled operation. So these two circuits are equivalent, but uh, it's not completely obvious, right? Um, okay, so if I go back to the global picture, what I'm doing here is actually this a little triangle. That is, I start with a circuit, I'm encoding it, decode it, and I get a circuit which is uh, completely different, but I need to have enough equations to actually prove that they are equivalent. Okay, I need to be able to prove that this circuit is equivalent to this one. And to do that, essentially what we need is all the basic properties of control gate. Okay. 
Um, so for instance, uh, here, the fact that if you have uh, two control gates uh, with here a black control, here a white control, you can just remove it. And you also have uh, commutation properties. If you have a white control and black control, whatever the rest of the control operation is, you can always uh, commute them. So this is what I mean by a basic algebra of control gates. Okay, so here we know that we need all these equations in our uh, quantum circuit uh, equational theory. Okay, so here is just about the triangle here. Now, if I look at the rest of the proof, each step here in the optical part is the application of one of these rules. And for one, each of these applications, I should be able to simulate it on the quantum circuit side. So let's take just one example. If on this side, I'm applying this uh, very simple uh, rule for optical circuits. What it means is that I'm applying it actually in a context. So I'm applying it here, for instance, but we have all the wires, which means that what I need to do in terms of quantum circuits is to do these kind of equations. Again, I have control operations. Okay, And so for each equation here, we can get uh, the equivalent equation using the decoding, which is made of multi-controlled gates. Okay, so now we have, we construct uh, uh, all the equations we need for the completeness like this, so it's a completion procedure, and then we have to work to simplify this equational theory, and what, after uh, a lot of work simplifying this equational theory, what we get at the end of the day is this equational theory here. Um, so we have eight equations here on quantum circuits which are fairly standard and simple. We are happy with, uh, with these equations. It remains one equation involving multi-controlled gates. And actually it's not an equation but a family of equations because we have dots here, uh, which means that actually for any number of qubits we have such equation. We have an equation like this. Okay. Okay, so this equational theory is uh, complete. Actually, uh, the one I'm presenting here is uh, a, a simplification of the original one uh, of the Leakes paper. Uh, so this is an equational theory that we obtained recently with, uh, with Alexandre Clément, De Noé Delorme, and Renaud Villemar. Okay, so this is the complete equational theory for quantum circuits. And um, if you are not happy with this equation, which is acting on several qubits, there is a way to get rid of this, and this is, I'm going to finish with this. Uh, there is a way to get rid of this equation, this acting on multi-qubits. And the way to do it is actually to consider a slightly more general framework. Uh, here I'm going to use a quantum circuit with ancilla. Okay, I'm going to add two generators, uh, a generator for introducing a new qubit, a fresh qubit in the cat zero state and also a generator for removing a qubit which is in the k0 state. Here it's important that the qubit should be in the k0 state when you remove it. Okay, so we get a slightly more general framework where you can represent isometries. And what is interesting is that if you start with your equational theory for uh, the Vanilla quantum circuits, so quantum circuits with uh, unitary generators, you just need to add three equations which are governing this uh, initialization of qubits and qubit removal. Just these three simple equations, and you get a complete equational theory for this new model, this marginal model. Okay? So the equations are just when you initialize a qubit to apply a Z rotation, it's the same as doing nothing. And if you apply a C naught, if the first qubit is in the K0 state, again, you don't need to apply this C naught. And this one is trivial, it's just that if you initialize a qubit and you remove it, it's the same as doing nothing. Okay, so we can uh, turn our uh, completeness for uh, unitary circuits to a completeness result for quantum circuits with ancilla. And the good news is that in this more general framework, actually this equation can be proved by induction in such a way that it remains only the base case. So we can actually replace the big equation by just this one acting on two qubits and get this equational theory where all the uh, equations are acting on at most three qubits. Okay, so um, this is the end of my talk. So to uh, conclude, so I've talked about the law of calculus, so this graphical language for optical quantum computing. Uh, so I've shown the completeness results. So it's implemented, I said already that it's implemented in Perceval, so you can play with this if you like. 
Um, regarding quantum circuits, so we have introduced the first complete equational theory for quantum circuits. It was a, an open question for 30 years. And we also extend it to quantum circuits with Ancilla, which is a way to actually simplify the uh, equational theory. In terms of future work, so regarding optical circuits, uh, uh, we are looking at uh, adding new generators, which are not preserving the number of photons. And uh, regarding uh, quantum circuits, uh, it would be interesting to, to have, it would be very interesting actually, to, to have a complete equational theory for Clifford plus T. Because here it's for arbitrary circuit. But if we consider uh, this fragment, we don't uh, know any uh, complete equational theory for this one. Okay, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Simon, for uh, your great talk. And uh, I think we have not much time, but we can have uh, one or two questions. Uh, yeah, I see three questions. Well, OK, uh, I don't know if this question is well posed, but is there any hope of having sort of an approximate uh, equational theory? So like if, if two unitaries are close, then there's some way to witness that via transformation rules? Yeah, so it's a very good question. Uh, it's not easy to do this because um, there is the, the idea that each time you apply an equation, it could be uh, just uh, approximative, okay, an approximation, so up to epsilon. But then, uh, then uh, the idea of the equational theory is to take the, the transitive closure. Uh, but uh, then uh, you, you, you have to control how the errors propagate. So that's, that's the challenge for, for these kind of things. But yeah, that's interesting. Uh, thank you. Uh, I had a technical question about the completeness proof. Um, does the proof of completeness just follow from a diamond dilemma, or um, is it slightly different? Oh, in the, uh, in the uh, optical case, um, yeah, it's, uh, yes, once you have the rewriting rules, uh, the rewriting system, uh, yes, uh, the proof is really based on the normalization. So you're, you're just resolving ambiguities in the relationships that you've defined for your, for your generators, or? Uh, Maybe we can talk offline. It's yeah, fine. okay. Yeah. So supposing that you were to restrict this to a certain gate set, like Clifford mm -hmm. T, let's say, do you think a situation could arise where the size of the rule set could be very large, depending on the gate set that you pick? Um, okay, good question. So, uh, so here, uh, okay, so first a remark, here we choose the, the commonly used C0, Hadamard, and Z rotation get set, because uh, it's a standard one. You can choose the, the one you want if it's uh, reasonable, in particular if you are using just finite gates, uh, you can translate uh, the result to your uh, favorite gate set. Uh, now, regarding the question of taking a, a subset, so for instance, Clifford plus T, uh, the problem is uh, with our equational theory is that it's not um, uh, it's not closed for uh, for this uh, subset. In particular, uh, for instance, the first rule, this one, which is a Euler uh, decomposition. So here it means that for any angle alpha, there exist angles beta such that the equation is true. And in particular, if your uh, circuit here is in Clifford plus T, here you are going to go outside of this, uh, of this uh, fragment. And so you cannot use this rule, and then you lose completeness. Um, um, so, and the question was about the number of rules that we get. Uh, actually, uh, yes, there are, well, uh, Maybe there is a finite axiomatization for Clifford plus T, I don't know, but uh, there is nothing preventing uh, to have a, a finite uh, equational theory, but which will be different from this one because you, you have to, to somehow simulate this and uh, this in, uh, in, uh, in Clifford plus T. Time for a, there is time for a last question, if any. Uh, 
I have also a question. Um, I was was striking that you derived essentially seven equations so for the optical circuits. What uh, uh, what was the idea or the inspiration that led you to exactly those equations, and are they a unique set, or can you there can be somehow interchanges with other? Huh. Um. Okay, so we have a kind of interpretation for all these equations. I will not go through, but uh, some of them are fairly simple. So this simplification, when you have 0 or 2 pi, you can simplify it again for the same for this one. Uh, the addition, some commutation properties. Here, the decomposition of swaps. So they are fairly natural uh, equations to have. Uh, these two are more complicated. They correspond to uh, Euler decomposition of angles. And... Um, so we proved that this set of equations is actually minimal in the sense that you cannot remove uh, any of these equations. At the beginning, we, we add much more equations and uh, we, we, uh, we converge to this one by removing some uh, equations that can be derived from the other ones. Uh, so that's how we, we obtain this uh, equational theory. Yeah. It's interesting, this seven, like the magic number of <laughs> equation for completeness. All right. So I think... I think uh, there was maybe another question. Yeah, yeah maybe a quick one. Uh, thanks for the great talk. I'm wondering if your equational representation of circuits and their equivalences, does this have any impact on the hardness of identity testing? Like kind of like checking whether two circuits are equivalent is hard? Uh, and okay. now you have an axiomatic system, so... Uh, yes, yeah, so th there are some connections, for instance, uh, um, on simulations or on uh, testing the, uh, the equivalence, of course. And in particular, it gives you bounds on the, on the size of the derivation. We, we know that it's not possible to have a, a short uh, derivation, a polynomial size derivation for uh, each pair of circuits. Otherwise, it would imply that it's uh, in NP and so on. So there are some consequences like this here. Yeah. Very good. I think it's now time to wrap up and uh, uh, enjoy your lunch. Uh, thanks, everybody, for attending this uh, session on circuit transformations. And thanks again to the speaker, to Simon, and all other speakers today. Thank you.